In this video, I want to show you one simple hack that makes every wheat-based dough probably 10 times better. Now, this works for both yeast-based doughs and sourdough-based doughs. Let me show you, and it's surprisingly simple. So, in the evening time, I'm preparing the first dough. And this is all you have to do for your hack. We're just gonna be stirring this until I know that there are no chunks of flour left. And then we're gonna let this sit overnight at room temperature. And you will be surprised how much of a difference this is going to make. German mode activated, <laughs> no flour goes to waste. And now all we are going to do is we will let this sit overnight. What? <laughs> yep, that's it. And now let me explain the why. Some people like to call this slow fermentation, but that's wrong. It's actually not fermentation. Fermentation starts to happen the moment we add our leavening agent. That can be yeast or sourdough. This is not the case what happens here when mixing flour and water. Something on a biochemical level is happening. I stopped the video on the best possible moment. Look at my crazy face. Seriously, I never wanted to show my face on YouTube. But then I thought, okay, whatever. If I want to show everybody around the world how to bake amazing bread and pizza, then I just gotta do it. Anyway, so this process is what bakers like to call the autolysis. Autolysis, seriously, I have no idea how to pronounce it. Please do correct me. More on that at the end of this video. Anyways, so by just mixing flour and water, this process is starting. Autolysis. So let's shed some light on this process and let me show you how you can use it to your own advantage. With the goal, of course, to make the best bread, the best pizza, whatever you prefer. So when the grain out of which the flour is made is soaked in water, the germination process starts. This is essential to understand. The grain has to undergo a couple of transformations in order to sprout. Now with the flour, the germ is already ground and can no longer sprout. Sorry, poor germ. However, the enzymes that catalyze this process are still there. This is happening because the germ needs energy to sprout. The energy for that is stored in the starch, the white part of the flour. However, the starch is in an optimal starch setup. It's not ready yet for the germ. That's why the germ comes with an enzyme called amylase. The amylases, please excuse my poor German pronunciation, we would say amylase, the amylase breaks down the starch starch into less complex sugar molecules. This is your germ's food. On top of that, the sneaky yeast and or sourdough is joining the party and is stealing the germ's munchies. So, by simply letting your dough sit for a while, you are creating a lot of yummy food for the tiny microorganisms that are about to enter a crazy munchy mode and will start farting. Well, and the farting is going to inflate your dough. Hmm. Yeast farts. Nice. Hante, did you know that your saliva contains amylase as well? Seriously, what the fuck are you doing? Sorry. <laughs> Back to the infographic. Yep, I made it for this video. I really had to show you. Furthermore, the germ also needs certain proteins in order to be able to grow. Around 80% of the seed storage is gluten. Now, gluten is essential to bread bakers. That's because it forms a really tight inflatable structure. It allows us to inflate the dough. Yep, that's me trying to inflate the gluten at work. So, the gluten is broken down by the germ. This is on the one hand bad for us, as our dough can no longer hold the yeast farts. On the other hand, this also softens the overall gluten network, making a more extensible dough. A more extensible dough is easier to inflate. Try inflating a car tire in comparison to trying to inflate a balloon. The balloon is much easier to inflate. At the same time, I personally feel that the more broken down dough is easier to digest. You don't feel as full. Now look at this amazing chart which I made for you. Super pro PowerPoint skills. Level 300. Anyways, without the hack you have to knead more, you have less browning, you have a tighter crumb structure, slower fermentation, you feel more full. It's not that great. Now by applying the autolysis you get a lot of dough strength just by waiting. You have better browning during the bake as you have more sugars available. You have a softer and more open crumb structure. You have a faster fermentation in the end and it feels much lighter when eating. Nice. This all sounds amazing, but there's a big fat butt to it. Sorry, let me explain. If you autolyse for too long, at some point 
the proteas will have broken down your gluten completely. This is even more severe with sourdough baking as the bacteria also feeds on the gluten. You will have a dough that can no longer hold its structure. <laughs> You will need to use a loaf pan. By the way, it's not necessarily bad, it might even be healthier. But if you want fluffy bread, then this is not what you want. So let me go back to what I said before, letting the dough sit overnight. All we are going to do is we will let this sit overnight. Now that's a recommendation that might not work for you. Let me clarify. No, God, please, no, no! So the factors that you should consider are, for instance, your flour's gluten content. In my case, my flour has a high protein percentage. Around 80% of the protein is gluten for wheat. The flour overall has around 15% protein, so double check your packaging. The more gluten you have, and generally, the longer you can ferment, because there's more gluten that can be broken down. Another factor is warmth. Of course, the hotter it is where you live, the faster the whole process goes. If it's colder, things are also slower for you. The third point that I want to mention, enzymatic content. How much of amylase and how much of proteas do you actually have in your flour? I've never seen somebody writing that on the packaging. But large mills are definitely blending the flour to make sure that every year they have similar flour. Else the timings in the large scale bakeries would be completely off. The last question is what do you prefer? Do you want to have a more soft dough? Do you want it to be a little bit more chewy? Do you want it to have a tighter crumb? Do you want it to have a more open crumb? It depends on what you prefer. Seriously, what the fuck are you doing? So the next logical question is, please, Hendrik, for how long should I do that? Don't <laughs> confuse me any further. <laughs> for me now, during winter times at around 22 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, there seems to be a magical 12 hour limit. With my very strong flour, the limit is a little bit higher. In the past year, in summer times, my limit was always at around 10 hours. And that's around 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you're making a dough which has around 1% dry yeast calculated based on the flour, then I recommend you to do an autolysis for around 6 to 10 hours. If you are using very little amounts of yeast, which is something, for instance, which is also done in a Neapolitan pizzeria, there the dough sits for a long period of time, then you don't have to do this autolysis. That's because while your yeast is fermenting, the same enzymatic activity is happening right inside of your dough. If you are baking sourdough at a cold temperature, like for instance in winter times for me, then I notice you don't have to do an autolysis as well. Just mix together all the ingredients. In fact, you might even have negative effects because your dough is too long at room temperature. And then we run again into that danger zone. So in fact, I already did a full video on that, comparing an oddly sardo versus a non oddly sardo, and the difference was just marginal. That's because the overall fermentation took me around 12 hours. But still, I personally didn't fully understand what was happening, so I had to hit the books one more time and really understand what was going on. And this is this video. Now in case it's warm where you live, so you have a temperature of more than 25 degrees Celsius or around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. In that case, your main sourdough fermentation is going to be done in around 5 hours, which is very fast for sourdough. In that case, I would be doing an autolysis of 2-3 to three hours. And that's why the activity level of your sourdough starter is also important, because you want to be in that time frame. You need to inflate your dough for a certain level, and of course if your sourdough is too slow, if it takes let's say 20 hours or so, then your dough has broken down. In fact, I built a small table which you can find at table.thebreadcode.io and that table shows you based on your temperature and based on how much sourdough solder you are using for how long approximately you should ferment. Of course, please take this with a grain of salt because every flour and every sourdough is unique, but this just gives you rough timings. For yeast, this is a different story, but more on that later. I'll be sharing the link to the table in the description as well, so that you can just click on the link and you have this magic table opened. Nice. So enough talking, I want to put this to the test. I already autolysed one dough overnight. And now it's time to make a second dough which hasn't been autolysed. And I'm using yeast because I want to simulate a faster process. With sourdough I couldn't replicate this at the current temperature because it's simply too cold in my kitchen. Let me show you, the results were super interesting. Gluten Morgen. <laughs> so this is our dough in the morning. And look at this. This hack also gives you free dough strength. You don't have to knead as much. The gluten has aligned overnight. The dough flattened out a little bit, but this is already looking very, very good. I'm going to be using dry yeast. Now dry yeast is super efficient at fermenting your dough. 
It originally comes from the sourdough and at some point some experts have isolated it from the sourdough. In a sourdough you typically have 1 to 100 yeast to bacteria as a ratio. Now the amount of dry yeast that you should be using depends on how fast you want your dough to ferment. You can also be using fresh yeast. You should replace fresh yeast with a factor of 3 for dry yeast. It's pretty much the same organism. I like to always use around 1% of my flour's weight. That's going to be around 4 grams. Now I only have 7 grams in here, so I'm going to be reducing that to 3 grams. If I make my overnight pizza dough, I might be using as little as 0.1 grams because the yeast is going to replicate. So this is something handy to know about yeast. You can influence how fast you want your dough to be ready. What we can, however, not influence is the thing that already happened here, the amylase and protease breakdown. Let's use the yeast. I used my fine scale here just because I want to make sure that I have exactly the same amount of dry yeast. years later. <laughs> for mixing I'm using my machine because I want to make sure that both of them have been kneaded for the same amount of time. Of course the Audley's dough has an advantage. By waiting for some time your gluten strands automatically align. Now with a second dough I can't even after around 12 minutes of kneading the dough won't let go of the bowl. And that's because our gluten network has already started to break down. Now that's exactly what we want to happen. So I'm just going to be giving this one more minute of kneading and then we're done with this dough as well. Another cool hack to know that your dough is done, you will always manage this step of the fermentation, which is called bulk fermentation, because you bulk multiple doughs typically in one large batch, is to use a small sample jar. And for yeast-based doughs, I always like to extract a small piece of this and when I see that doubled in size for sourdough, you have to be a little bit more careful. You should not go for 100% size increase right away, maybe only 50%. Then I know this dough is ready for the next step. So I'm going to be extracting equal parts of both the doughs. And what I expect to happen is that here we have more ready sugars available. And so this fermentation is going to be way faster than this fermentation. Let me show you. And yeah, just a uh, note, I poked the dough a little bit just to test. And this one is also feeling a little less sticky than this dough. So quite interesting. This one is more extensible, which has pros and cons, of course. And this one is still relatively stiff. And now I'm going to let them ferment until the sample, which I just prepared, has doubled in size. Let me show you that time lapse and then it's about shaping time. Oh, I always love watching those time lapses. They're so satisfying. Interestingly, the Audley's dough didn't win in this experiment. I thought it would rise faster, but that can also be explained by the gluten network already broken down. It's leaking some gas. It's almost like a flat tire. Anyways, let's continue. At this point, I was already super hungry and so desperate to eat a fresh slice of bread. That's what I love about this hobby. Even if you fail, you always have amazing bread. <laughs> Being a German, we wouldn't ever let any go to waste.
Now I'm gonna wait until they pass the finger poke test, which is when this dent here recovers very, very slowly, and then they are ready to bake. Nice. I'll place them shortly before the test passes in the freezer, uh, just to make scoring in the end a little bit easier. I am the one, the one, your son, don't need the That's another great hack to learn. Room temperature proofing, freezing the dough for 30 minutes, it's gonna make scoring, where we have to do a small incision in the end, so much easier. And look at how much the dough increased in size. You can see the dent recovers relatively slowly. Here it's still very fast, so this could actually prove even a little bit longer. But um, I don't want to wait too long. I want to bake them both at the same time to just make sure that I have exactly the same baking setup. And I'm going to be putting both of them in my freezer now for a little bit to help me with the scoring in the end. two breads. Can you see that? How the right one is just so much larger in size than the left one. The right one was the one that we auto leased. One more time, you can see just how much larger this one is. Now with yeast bread, I never get that sort of ear. I think it might have too much leavening power. One thing that I also want you to have a look at is just how much darker this bread is than this bread. And now just to make sure that we have a fair comparison, I rotated the stone half time during the baking process. I did that because sometimes you have hot spots in your oven. You wouldn't expect, but ovens can be totally random and crazy. And that's because of the sugars that are available for the fermentation and as well during the bake. They will caramelize. I'm super excited to have a look at the actual crumb of the breads. I expect that this one is way fluffier than this one. Let's see. Let's start with the auto leaf bread. Oh wow, look at this fluffiness here. And now let's check out the next bread, the one where we didn't do any auto leases. Also a great crumb, looking very nice as well. Let's compare them side to side. So from a visual perspective, I'm not seeing that much of a difference, except I do have a very few pockets of air here, but that might also have just been me during the shaping. But when I just touch the crumb here, it feels a lot more extensible. This one feels a little bit denser. This one really just, ah, oh, it's so super, super, super fluffy. So the right one feels more fluffy than the left one. Okay, let's put this to a taste test. The Audelis dough and the non Audelis. And I'm very curious how the crust here tastes. I like the coloring of this crust more. And every different color is going to add additional great taste. Let me start with this bread, the one which we didn't Audelis. Great taste. It's also fluffy. It's good. And now let's taste this masterpiece. Mmm. Mm -hmm. This one tastes relatively plain and this one just has so much more flavor to it. Also the actual dough here. Yes. And also the consistency. It's really much softer than this dough here. I mean, this is already relatively fluffy, right? But this one here, it just melts. This is amazing. So taste-wise, the Audelis one definitely won. Hope you had fun watching this video. As always, happy baking and may the gluten be with you. By the way, how to actually pronounce this? Is it Amulas, Prodias? I really have no idea and I'm super confused <laughs> with the pronunciation in the English language.
And maybe that's just because I'm German and we Germans always have issues uh, speaking the English. So please do enlighten me. I love it when you guys correct my Denglish, so please keep doing that. But sometimes I'm also confused because some British say this, some Americans say this. So yeah, maybe it's, uh, it's just me. Seriously, what the fuck are you doing?